bless the Lord. Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, thank you for your workings, your dealings, your crushing, your pressing in our lives. May we not recover. Holy Spirit, help us not to recover from this experience, from these dealings. Let it bear forth fruit. The years to come to become a reference point. Amen. Thank you. Let's be seated. So many things to, to say, but there's no time. One of the things that Pastor, you said a lot of things, Pastor Jimmy said a lot of things, and I want to encourage us to be no, early this morning, around that should be around four or so. Based on our schedule, I'm supposed to close the the meeting with the last teaching. But while I was in my study, I just perceived in the spirit that uh, what the Lord is putting in my heart to say uh, may not be I don't know, I don't know how to describe it I should just because I was um, I was perceiving in my spirit that, uh, that we should hang with something not just something able to minister to people so I just put a text to Pastor Tim. I said, sorry if it won't disturb your program. We would like to change. You take the last teaching for today. So, after some time he responded, I said, okay. It's okay. So I was so glad when he said that what he's going to be doing when he come back, the last teaching is impartation. Friends, I told her yesterday, the Holy Spirit still talk. It is either we are deaf eh? or we are just stubborn. The Holy Spirit still talks. But there is something he said that, that broke me. Pay the price. Did you hear that? Pay the price. Let's pay the price. I see this generation, we are too lazy. Let's pay the price. This well. Pastor Zhu, God bless you. After a long time, long years, it's joy to have you around. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Pastor Hike has gone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for every other person I'm seeing. The Lord bless you. When I finished my secondary school, I wanted to go to University of Ife. But unfortunately, I didn't meet up. So I settled down for Polytechnic. So in my mind, I said, no, I've spent all my life in Lagos. Uh, let me go to a Polytechnic that is outside of Lagos. So I chose Ogun State Polytechnic. What is being called that today? I don't know what. Eh? Abiola? Ma? 
Must shoot the Abiola in hand. I know that's what I know, but then it was Ogunsti Polytechnic. I went there. I had the, I had the, I won't tell you my score. <laughs> but I, I had hope. But unfortunately, I was not taken. Despite the result that I had. Then the second time again, I said, no. I'm, not, I'm tired of Lagos. I was already born again. So this time around, I chose Ogun State. I remember my uncle then said, why are you too rigid? Choose Ogun State and then choose. Because the first one I did, I chose Ogun State, Ogun State first choice, Ogun State second choice. Because I was not ready to stay in Lagos. So the second time he said, why not be flexible? Choose Ogun State and then choose Lagos State. So I chose Lagos. Reluctantly. But unfortunately, I wasn't taking Ogun State, but I was taking in Lagos State. I never knew that God was setting me up for something. It was in Lagos State Polytechnic I met Bishop Inka Jakaye. Uh, Bishop Inka Jakaye is uh, people who are NIFES. He was once a national secretary of NIFES. So if you don't know, this is Bishop Inka. He served in the time of um, Bara Prosper. 2000 and what? 2001. So this is the fourth. We are having in our midst the one-time national secretary of NIFES. Yeah. Yeah. That was where we met. Yeah. And that was where I met my wife. I'm saying this for a purpose, so don't get carried away by clapping. <laughs> Pastor, you said there's some certain value we have lost, being led by the Spirit. What was leading me? Ego. I've stayed in Lagos for a long time. Huh? But God, who saw into the future, knew I would need this man, these people, this man. Yeah. When I met men, I met people in Lagos State Polytechnic who are relevant to my destiny right now. And now, I did a letter, let. I one day I just saw this guy. And I went to go and approach him. There's something about him that caught my attention. We're in the same class. In fact, this is a decision student. He was a decision student in those days. He was the best in our school. And that was how we got connected. We've been through. It's a relationship that is divine. In those days, I wish we can go back to those days, honestly. We talk about return. We will pray. We will study the Bible and we will start crying. I'm telling you. We will start crying. Why are we crying? The state of the church. We will pray. We will study God's word. Cry. Challenging ourselves. Let us go after God. He's a man that I respect so much. He has made. I don't flatter people. Flattering is a sin. I say that. I don't. But I respect the grace of God. There are no new revelations I shared without consulting him. Yeah. Check note with him. He's a man who has imparted my life. And I'm glad God brought him to this ministry. Yeah. 
T.S., you are welcome. God bless you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your love. T.S. is training secretary. This is the training secretary of Nigerian Fellowship of Evangelical Students in Portaco Zoom. Can you please stand up? Let's, let them see you. Very handsome man. Yeah. Isn't that handsome? I say I don't flatter. Yeah. Can you please welcome with me, my friend? My friend. And today is his birthday. You know, he, he, he told me, he said, he said, you have made me to miss spending my birthday with my wife twice now. Last year and this year. And I can't guarantee whether you also not miss the next day. <laughs> okay, the birthday will be on Sunday or Monday, so you won't miss it. God bless you, sir. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Really, I don't, I don't understand why Pastor Femi asked me to come and speak after Pastor Tunji have already spoken. Because it's, it's actually intimidating. <laughs> That's the truth, it's intimidating. If I have my way, I will probably just sneak out and then and just disappear. But I trust God that this morning the Lord will still speak to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this morning. We exalt you because you're a good God. Thank you, God, for what you have started with us with. And thank you because even today you've done some, something so marvelous in our sight. We ask, oh God, you continue in this frequency in the name of Jesus. Speak to our hearts. And let your name be glorified. There, Holy Spirit, we welcome you once again. Give us utterance to speak your word and has to receive in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. Thank God that I'm here today. And I also want to thank my uh, our leader, the leader of Voice of Truth, Global Apostolic Ministry. Did I, did I pronounce it well? Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you for the opportunity, the privilege to stand before um, the people of God to share God's word. And I also want to thank all the leaders that are here, all the pastors, church leaders, um, for being here to hear what God is going to bring across our way today. I usually say this anytime men of stature have spoken, and which is, you know, in the house, it is the youngest child that you have school to go and clean the plates, to do the dishes after the men, the parents have eaten. And so I think that is what I'm going to do here today. So Pastor Tunji and my friend Pastor Femi are the big stature here, and I'm just the youngest among them to just give the little that God has put in my heart to give. What I'm asked to share with us today is the believer's inheritance. And I want to talk about understanding the inheritance of the believer. We are going to read that central text, which is for this theme, and that is Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We'll read verse 1 to verse 14. That is our central text for this teaching and also for the theme of this conference. The believer's inheritance, understanding the inheritance of the believers. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. That means what Paul was saying here was not only to the church in Ephesus. It also applied to every Christian all over the world. The faithful in Christ. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. How many? All. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself 
according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has proposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, I'd like you to pay attention to verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted, after that you had the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the harness of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Now, if you look at the Bible very well, you will see that the Bible talks about the inheritance of believers, of Christians. And this inheritance is like two sides of the same coin. That is one that we have received now, and that is one that is kept for us in heaven that we're going to get when Jesus appears. And what I will try to do this morning is to focus more on what we have received now and then dwell a little on the one that God has prepared for us for eternity. Amen? The Bible says in verse 11, in whom also we have obtained and inheritance. Now, talking about Christ, in whom we, not all the people in the world, but in whom we believers have obtained an inheritance. Now, if you have obtained it, it means it is yours. You have it. If you have obtained an inheritance, it means that inheritance is something that you have already. And we're going to look at what inheritance have we obtained in Christ. And now do we begin to walk in that inheritance? But the truth of the matter is, this inheritance is not for everyone. It is only for those who are saved in Jesus Christ. So if you have been born again, if you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, if you have been washed with the precious blood of Jesus, then you have an inheritance in Christ. Everyone has it. Every believer has it. If you have been washed in the blood of Jesus, you have this inheritance. You see, when God created man, you know the Bible says God created man in his own image, and according to his own likeness, right? But if you read Psalm 8 from verse 4 to verse 7, Psalms 8, verse 4 to verse 7, the Bible said, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him? For you have crowned him with glory and with honor, and you have made him to have dominion over all the works of your hands. When God created us, God created us in his own image and crowned us with glory and with honor. We looked like God when he created us because he made us in his own image. We looked like him. We had his glory. We had his honor at that time. And God gave us dominion over all the face of the earth. But the truth is, most times, we really, don't, we really don't appreciate the glory that God crowned man with because we were not there in the garden to see the glimpse of that glory. If you were in the garden of Eden to see how God decorated man, then you'll appreciate what God did for mankind. He created us and crowned us with glory and with honor. The word glory there is the Hebrew word kabod, and it means the weight of God's glory, the weight of his glory. I believe it is because of that weight of God's glory that we have dominion over the things he has created. The weight of his glory. God crowned us with that. Unfortunately, when man sinned, we lost that. The Bible said man has sinned and has fallen short of the glory of God. 
He crowned us with his glory and crowned us with his honor also. The word honor there means excellence. It means glamour. It means beauty. God gave us all these things when he created us. But unfortunately, Adam committed a high treason against God by joining with the devil. And then we lost that glory. Adam lost it. And by virtue of his disobedience to God, he plunged the entire humanity into darkness. And so everyone became a servant to Satan. And we inherited his own nature. Do you know that if Adam had not sinned against God, Satan wouldn't have had anything to lay claim to when he fell. He wouldn't have had anything. When Satan fell and God, and I mean, he rebelled against God and he lost his position before God, he would have been wandering all about aimlessly. But he needed to have something to lay claim to. So he came to man. He came to, of course, he deceived Eve. And then Adam willfully, and I think foolishly too, submitted the authority of this world unto him. Originally, Satan had nothing. He had nothing. But Adam submitted the authority of this world unto him. Remember when, Je when Jesus was tempted in, um, in the wilderness, Satan told him, he said, all the glory of this world, all the kingdoms of this world, have been delivered unto me. Originally, they weren't his own. They belonged to us. Originally, those things were never the devils. They belonged to us. But Satan, in a cunning way, deceived him, and, and, and um, Adam willfully submitted the authority unto him. And so he had all those things. And that is why today, Satan can go about trying to lure men to get all those things by bowing to him. And unfortunately, many people have bowed to the devil so that they can have a bite of the glory of this world. So many people, even so-called preachers, even so-called preachers. Now, let's look at this inheritance, and I'd like us to look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. Colossians 1 verse 12. The Bible says, giving thanks unto the Father, who has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Let's look at that version, um, the same verse in the New International Version, NIV Version. Let's look at it. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. No, no, not that one. Verse 12, please. Verse 12. Colossians, Colossians 1, 12. Okay. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. That means you are qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. The inheritance is ours, but we need to look at what the inheritance is and how to walk in it. The first thing I'd like to, put on, to point your attention to is that if we, have, we have received eternal life from God. That is one of the inheritance that we have received from God, eternal life. Eternal life. In John chapter 5 and verse 24, Jesus said, whoever hears my word and believes in me has eternal life. He has eternal life. That is one of the things that God has given to us when we believed in Jesus Christ. He has given to us eternal life. But why would God start with that? Why will God give us eternal life in the first place when we believe in Jesus? The reason is because when Adam sinned against God, Adam died. Remember God told him, the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die, right? When Adam ate of that fruit, what happened to him? Did he die that day? Huh? <laughs> Did Adam die? When he sinned against God. Yes or no? Yes. He died. 
Okay. Sometimes I wonder if he was the only one that heard of that forbidden fruit and then I'm getting hit of it, what would have happened? Because you know the Bible says, when Adam heard of that fruit, then their eyes opened. So what would have happened if he heard it and Adam said, you heard of that thing that God said we shouldn't eat of. Me, I will report to you until God, I will report to you when God comes. And he kept away from that. What would have happened to humanity? But Adam wasn't deceived, the Bible says. Eve was deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam intentionally, intentionally obeyed the voice of his wife, contrary to the instruction of God, took of that fruit and ate it. Pastor Bakari said that was the first time a woman will feed a man. And that was what resulted in the fall of man. Hmm? Apology to women. That was the first time a woman will ever feed a man. And that was the first time man was plunged into darkness. And he prayed the prayer that day. He said, I pray my wife will be rich and wealthy, but I will still be the breadwinner of the house. Unfortunately, when Adam heard of that fruit, he died. The real man called Adam, the man on the inside, died. It was in that dead state he started giving birth to children. And so everybody that came from Adam came as dead people. Everyone. All the people that came. It is very unfortunate. Adam didn't start giving birth when he was alive. He started giving birth when he died. The spirit man in him died. He lost communion with God. God had to banish him out of the garden. It was in that dead state he started giving birth to children. And so everybody that came from Adam came as dead people into this world. That was why Jesus said, if you believe in him, in me, you will have life. That life that you lost will be restored unto you. You will have it. You will receive life when you now believe in me. Jesus wasn't talking about the physical body. He was contacting the spirit man in those people. Unfortunately, many of our preachings today have to do with our soul and our body. We don't really contact the spirit man when we deliver the word of God unto people. But Jesus, when he was speaking, he was contacting the spirit of those people and said, if you believe in me, you will receive life, eternal life. The very life of God will come into you. What Adam lost will be restored unto you. That death that you inherited in Adam, you will now begin to receive life from me and inherit life in me. And it was years later that Adam's body now eventually died. But the man called Adam himself, the real man on the inside, had died. Unfortunately today, there are so many dead people walking about. You know, sometimes we often confuse breath with the life of God. Somebody can be breathing and not have the life of God in him. He can be breathing. God gave you breath for existence. And so you are breathing, you have breath, and then you are moving around. And today we have, we have redefined what life is. Life is the very nature of God. It's not the same thing as breath. Because people are breathing and yet they are dead. But Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will receive life. And then I will now raise your body on the last day. And you don't receive life by attending church services. You receive life by believing in Jesus Christ himself. Unfortunately, there are so many dead people in our local assemblies, so many dead preachers preaching the gospel. And they are dead. But today, as many as are dead among us, we receive life in the name of Jesus. Because that life is the very life of God. And when that life enters into you, you begin to behave like him. We begin to do things the way God expects you to do them. It's very simple. You know that when a dog gives birth, 
a dog will give birth to another dog, right? What is a baby dog called? Puppy. And then you expect a dog to bark naturally because it is his nature to bark, right? What would you think? How will you, how will you see it when you see a dog? Uh, or rather, when you see a cat barking like a dog, If you have a cat, a cat in your house, and then you walk into your sitting room one day, and you see the cat barking like a dog, what will you do? Because you know it's not natural. It's not normal. How can a cat be barking like a dog? Why? Because the life of a dog is not in that cat. It doesn't have the nature of a dog. In the same way, when the life of God does not enter into you, you can't behave like him. You can be taught the ways, the manners. You can be speaking like them, but you can't manifest that life. You can be talking like a believer. You can even learn how to speak in tongues, but you can't behave like a Christian. You can't, because the nature of God is not inside of you. It is only when that life comes into you that you can now begin to behave like God. And people will look at you and say, there's something different about you. You don't, you don't just fake it. You are now real. The nature comes out of you. We receive life when we put our faith in Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's look at verse 9 to verse 10. Now, I don't speak eloquently like Pastor Tunji, so just bear with me. Amen. 2 Timothy 1. Talking about our salvation in God. Paul said, who, that means God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Then verse 10. But it has now been, re it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That is why the only way people can receive that life of God is by the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. You can't receive that life any other way. Unfortunately today, there are so many people in assemblies who are not hearing the gospel because that is not what is being preached. The Bible says Jesus destroyed death. But I thought the Bible says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So what death is he talking about here? If the last enemy to be destroyed is death, Abby, and here the Bible says, who has destroyed death? So what death is he talking about? The same death that Adam experienced, that we all have before we became born again. Jesus destroyed that and gave us life. And we can only receive that life by believing in Jesus. That is why today, anyone that is a believer is not a subject to Satan anymore. Satan used to have the keys of death and hell in his hands, but not anymore. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, that Jesus by his death has destroyed him that had, had the power of death. Now he has the keys of death and hell in his own hands. But Unfortunately, there are so many people who are still in the, in, in, in the world who are subject to Satan because they are still dead people. When you put your faith in Jesus, you are no longer dead. Satan is no longer your master. And you don't have to fear death anymore because now the keys of death and hell are now in the hands of Jesus, not in the hands of the devil. It used to be in his hands. It used to be in his hands. But the Bible says Jesus destroyed the devil who had in the past, who had the power of death. Today, the Lord will visit those who are dead in the name of Jesus. And whether it doesn't matter the area of your life that you're dead, whether it's physical, spiritual, marital, education-wise, any area, you will receive life in the precious name of Jesus. Now, the second thing you have received from God is his kingdom. The kingdom of God. The word kingdom there has to do with the rule of God, the authority of God, the power of God. 
Because the Greek word is basilia. It means the reign of God. The reign, the rule of God. One of the things the Father has given to us is his authority and his power. God has given to us his authority and his power. Jesus said, all power in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And immediately after saying that, he now said to us, go into the world and preach the gospel. He gave us the authority that he himself had. The authority of God was given to us. His power was given to us so that we can begin to advance his kingdom here on earth and fulfill destiny. Paul prayed a prayer in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul said, I pray the highest of your understanding be opened, that you might know the exceeding greatness of God's power in you and for you who believe. But the truth is, many people don't know the, kind, the power of God that is available on the inside of them. Many people don't know. So many believers, don't, they are not aware of the greatness of God's power on the inside of them. Somebody asked a question one day. Somebody said, which one is deadlier? Someone who has no power and someone who has power but doesn't know he has power. Do you get it? There's someone who is ignorant of the power of God in his life and there is someone who doesn't have the power of, of God at all in his life. Which one, is, which one is more dangerous? But the truth is there are so many believers today who are not aware of the power of God that is on the inside of them. They are not conscious of it. And so they are still being tossed here and there by circumstances, by demonic powers. They are still being tossed here and there by all kinds of situations because they are not aware of the power of God that is on the inside of them. Now, the power of God is not something you can just get, just like Pastor Tunji said, on, by watching TV or by sitting on a rocking chair. No. You've got to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the power of God to come into your life. I understand that the initial evidence, according to the Bible, is speaking in tongues. But there are so many people today who speak in tongues and are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Because they learn those things. And that is why the church seems to be weak today. The church seems to be weak. So when somebody has a problem, we refer to the person to a psychologist to deal with the situation. It's unlike the apostles. The apostles carried the power of God. Everywhere they went, they manifested the power of God in all situations of life. But today it's not like that. We speak in tongues and yet we don't, we don't manifest his power. Then something is wrong. Something is wrong. Any little thing, you begin to blast in tongues. Any little thing. And it's not even because the tongue is genuine. And you lack power in your life. God didn't promise us the Holy Spirit only for speaking in tongues. No. God, Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit baptism was given to us for empowerment. Do I understand? Initial evidence is speaking in tongues. Yes, that is true. But if you're speaking in tongues without an evidence of power, then something is wrong with your experience. Something is wrong. It's very unfortunate today that the church seems to be weak. Seems to be very weak. And so we have so many people who have come to the church to explain away our situation. Now, what you're experiencing today is, 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 is normal. You know, the apostles are not civilized. But today, like somebody was telling me, he said, the reason why today God does not really need to give us more power is because people are now enlightened. You know, there is internet everywhere, social media. So, so it doesn't really, But at that time, God needed to demonstrate that he is alive. So he needed to give them power. And I was wondering, where did he get this theology from? Where did he get it from? That no, 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 it's not. God does not really to give us that great power anymore. Because now people are enlightened. They can read and write for themselves. So they can read all these things on the internet. Explain the way why people are still sick in the church. Why people are still dying in the church. I remember there was a story of John G. Lake when he was in South Africa. He was in South Africa for five years. Do you know in five years, God used him to do about 100,000 miracles in five years. There was a particular one. There was a plague that 
broke out in South Africa. And so people were dying. As much, it was like Ebola. If you have a body contact with, such person, with the person that has contracted that disease, you also will contract the disease and die. If you bury the person, you die too. But it was only John G. Lake that was burying the dead. And doctors, scientists, they were warning him, stay away from these people, you will die. And he said, no, I won't die. You know why? Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. And he said, are you serious? He said, yes. He, was, he even buried the pastor that was dead. And he was one burying people around. And he, they said, no, 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 no. Something is wrong with you. And he put them to a test. He told them, don't worry. Take the germs from any dead person. Place them on my hand. You will see the germs die. They said, no, 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 no. And he enforced that, 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 um, that experiment. He said, you have to do it by force. So they took the saliva of someone that was dead, of that disease. Place the germs on his hands. Use a microscope to check. After a while, they saw the germs slowing down their movement and they died. But when Ebola struck, people even are afraid of shaking themselves in the church. Ebola. Ah, brother, good morning. God bless you. God bless you. Ebola, God bless you. God bless you. Why? Because we lack the power. We lack it. We lack the power. You even see pastor. Pastor cannot check another pastor in the same assembly. Say hi to your neighbor. Hi. God bless you. I beg don't stay too close to me. Oh. I don't know if you have it. Remember in my office. Ah. Femi. You will see people before they open the door knob. The door knob. They will clean it. Open, come back, use hand sanitizer to wash their hands. What are you, what are you afraid of? They can't sit in, in, in the same bus with a passenger. Uh, 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 you are getting too close to me. Please shift now. A hey, Christian, and then in church, ba 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 ba. You are saying nonsense because your life lacks power. It lacks it. What God has given to us is His kingdom, His power, and His authority. We are supposed to go everywhere and manifest that. Do you know the reason why the preaching of the gospel is, seems to be difficult to be preached today? You know why? Because power, the power of God is not evident in what we preach. Yes, yes. You go out and preach, and in the midst of 1,000 people, you now say somebody is there, you have an headache. It's possible. Common sense will tell you somebody in the auditorium can have an headache in the midst of 1,000 people. Give us, give us genuine cases. And then you are saying people are not coming to church. Why now? Why? Do evangelism. And then you do evangelism, nothing is still forthcoming. Because there is no power evident in your life. Power of God is no evident in your life. And God gave us the Holy Spirit to give us power. To give us power. Everybody shout power. power. We need it to advance his kingdom here on earth. And to fulfill the destiny he has placed in our hearts. We need God's power to advance his kingdom. We can't do that without his power. Do you know the church would have been dead if the Holy Spirit had not been with the church? The church would have been dead a long time ago. If you leave, if Jesus had left the church with the apostles without the power of God, forget about Christianity. Forget about Jesus. But Jesus knew that long after I have gone, my name will still be ringing on the face of the earth. Why? Because he has promised to send his Holy Spirit unto us. You can imagine, Jesus, who was arrested and denied by Peter and Jesus told him Peter you love me more than all these people he said yes then feed my sheep why would Jesus commit the church into the hands of the apostles the preaching of his gospel into their hands when he is about to leave because he knew that once the Holy Spirit comes upon them they will have the power to do all those things and stand in the face of opposition without backing out he knew that that was why Peter, when he was challenged, he said, Men and brethren, think among yourselves, who should we obey, God or, or man? Peter, who denied Jesus in the presence of a little girl, could not stand before thousands of people and say, That Jesus, whom you crucified, is now Lord and Christ. Not afraid of death anymore. Why? Because the power of God was evident in their lives. May God restore power unto us today. Amen. In the name of Jesus. We need that. We need the power of God. God gave unto us his kingdom. Give unto us his kingdom. Ah. 
Hallelujah. And so the Holy Spirit is part of our inheritance in Christ Jesus. God promised to give unto us his spirit and he has done that by sending him to us. And today the Holy Spirit is no longer in heaven. He's here. Huh? The Holy Spirit is where? He's here. He's here. Now you can be a Christian and yet lack the power of God. It's possible. And the reason is because you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Am I going into your message? Well, let me just say a little about that. Pastor Femi will dwell much on it. When you are born again, the Holy Spirit comes and takes residence, residence inside of you, in your spirit. Comes and stay in your spirit, man. That was a particular case that I heard of in our church in Ogun State. There was a lady who was coming to church, and then out of zeal, she was going about doing evangelism, preaching, talking to people, and then a few months later, they brought her to the church that she, she was... Um, mentally insane. What happened? How come? And they said she was going about preaching, doing all those things. Whether she was saved or not, we couldn't tell. But what was evident is that a life lacks the power of God. You know you can't cast out devils without the power of God. They won't obey the size of your Bible. They won't even obey your English language. How, how, how eloquent you are in speaking English. That is not what demons obey. That is not what they res it is not what they respect. That you can speak good English. Forget about that. Ask all those professors who are still demon possessed. In spite of their English and their understanding of mathematics and calculus and what have you, yet they are demon bound. <laughs> that was a particular story that I had. Of one... Uh, Educated man. Educated, highly educated. Who came to a pastor? Ah. And the pastor said, you will pray now that all the demons tormenting him in life went out. Went out. Went out. The professor had to say it like that. Brian, the professor had to say that English like that. But he was free. He was delivered. So demons don't respect your size of English, your, your eloquence. They don't respect that. It is the anointing of God that they respect in your life. He was saying, went out, went out, and he was delivered. Huh? He was delivered. Demons understand that. What this man meant to say is go out. So I have to leave because the anointing is present. It's present. But why is the church lacking the power of God today? Because they have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Pen, many people speak in tongues, yet they don't have that genuine experience of the baptism. So we speak in tongues. See all kinds of things. Let's, let's look at the scripture. Acts 5 verse 12. Look at something there. Acts 5 verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And we are all in one accord in Solomon's porch. Go to verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Verse 15. So they brought the sick out into where? Not in the temple anymore. In the streets. In the streets. You don't get it. They brought the sick and laid them down on the streets. Why? They laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Revival not happening in the church, outside of the church building. On the streets. And look at what happened next. Verse 16. And also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who are tormented by unclean spirits. And they were... All. How many were healed? All. How many? All. 
all were healed. All. They didn't blame people who don't receive their healing for lack of faith. Because today in our church, that is what the pastor will, will say as the reason why they don't get healed. I prayed for you and you didn't get healed because you don't have faith. Here the Bible said they were all why? Because of the evidence of the power of God in their midst. They were all healed. May God restore power unto us today. Amen. In the name of Jesus. We need this. We need it. The Holy Spirit is part of our inheritance in Christ Jesus. We have received this kingdom. That is also part of our inheritance. And then the fourth thing we have received is God's divine nature. That is also part of our inheritance in Christ. His divine nature. God's divine nature causes us to behave like him. Let's look at this scripture. Second Timothy chapter, sorry, Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 1 to 3. 2 Peter 1, 1 to 3. Simon Peter, a born servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us how many things? All things. That pertain to, can you see life again there? That pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which, by glory and virtue, by which we have been given, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these, through these promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We receive that divine nature. Having escaped corruption. That comes through lust. The reason why many people today are still bound by lust. Bound by sin. Is because they have not received this divine nature. May you receive the divine, the divine nature of Christ. You... You are no longer subject to Satan. You are no longer bound by him. Even though temptation may come, but you are not bound by sin anymore. Sin will not have dominion over your life. In Romans chapter 6, the Bible says that we should not let sin reign in our mortal body. That we should obey it in his lust thereof. And I, come, I came to understand that sin comes through lust. When you indulge in your lust, you commit sin. When you fulfill the lust of your flesh, you commit sin. Right? Now, for those who are unbelievers, it is understandable. If you are not a Christian, lust can control your life. Lust, lust can be your master. Lust can be your controller. Lust can be all in all over you. You are bound by sin, so you can't escape it. Because you are not yet regenerated. You are still a sinner. The life of God is not inside of you. The nature of God is not in you. But what I don't understand is why would people who claim they are believers are still sinful? They are still bound by sin. And yet you claim you are a Christian. That is the part I don't really understand. How can you say you are a Christian and yet you sin against God? It doesn't prick you. That was a particular time, many, many years ago. That was a particular church. That, you know, there are some churches in this world. I won't mention names, but there are some church. Let, let me not call them church. There are some assemblies in this world that are, not, that are not of God. They are not of God. When I was coming in yesterday, when our brother came to pick me at the airport, and I began to see posters and handbills, I mean, banners all around. I said, people have not still changed. Uh -uh. The same thing you are still repeating over and over. Your Pharaoh must die. All those things, all kinds of things. 
you are still repeating the same thing. I thought Port Harcourt would have changed with your presence and the presence of pastors in Port Harcourt. I was wondering, is this thing still happening? I expect a change. But coming back again, I say, the same whole story. Same whole story. This assembly, they declared a fast in their place. And then one lady was sitting with a man in a house. I, was, I happened to be there that day. And the lady said, I don't know, I think the man touched her or something. No, no, the lady was the one touching the man. And one of their church leaders said, ah, but we are fasting now. He said, eh, since I don't have emotional, sexual feeling towards him, so I can still be touching him and be playing with him anyhow now. And I was wondering, you don't get it. She was touching him. The boy was, his boyfriend, was her boyfriend. And she was touching him, playing with him anyhow. The pastor, a pastor or a leader in their church came and said, stop, stop leave this boy alone. Can, you can arouse his, his emotions. He said, no, no, no. Uh, since I don't have emotional feeling towards him, I can still be playing with him like that. I can still be touching him anyhow. Today, there is no distinction between righteousness and holiness in the church. In fact, when you place a believer and a non-believer side by side, you don't see any difference. Because in addressing, we look alike. In attitude, we look alike. You don't get it. In the way we dress, eh, we look alike. Place a believer and a non-believer side by side. We look alike. And then you're back in, are you a Christian? Yes. Are you a Christian? No. Ah. But you look alike now. You're, you're almost the same. There's no difference. And people do this and they don't pay any attention to any check in their spirit. Sometimes I wonder, is this the same gospel that the apostles preached that we are preaching today? That there is no distinction between righteousness and holiness and sin anymore in the church. Why? Because the life, the nature of God is not in the people. It is not there. And the only way you can destroy sin, the body of sin in your life, is by going to the cross to die with Jesus there. That is the only way. There is no, there is no, it doesn't matter how many motivational books you read. You can't die to flesh, to the flesh, by just reading books. There is only one way to die. By going to the cross and die with Jesus on that cross. That is the only sure way. It is those that have died with Christ on the cross that can experience true life and be totally free from sin. It's not that temptation will not come to you, but you are not controlled by it anymore. You can now make a choice. Either to, that is why I always say it. When a believer sins or fornicates today, it is his choice. It's not tempt, it, yes, temptation came, but you chose to do it because you are no longer bound by sin anymore. The moment you are born again, you are no longer bound by sin. The, the, the excuse you give, hey, is this, yeah, I don't know, the thing is just all over me, it's controlling me. Mm. It means you've not died in the first place. Look at Romans chapter 6. Let's look at what the Bible says there. Romans chapter 6, and we'll read verse 4 and verse 5. Or verse 4 to verse 7. Romans 6. Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore, no, sorry, verse 4. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. You're supposed to walk in newness of life. Now, verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. In other words, if you truly died, you will truly live. It's simple. You can't experience true resurrection without true death. Because death cannot be faked. If you fake to have died, you can't experience true resurrection. It is only those who have truly died that can be like him in his resurrection. Now verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And verse 7. For he who has died 
has been freed from what? If you have died, you are free from sin. If you have died, you are free from sin. So to experience freedom from sin, what is the solution? Death is the solution to freedom from sin. If you truly want to be free from sin, death, die. That is the only solution. I can't control myself. Things are just happening. In fact, uh, I, just, I, I just don't know. I just do it. Mm. The only way to be free is to die. Go to the cross and die there. When you die, you're free. Can a dead man sin? Even people, even the living are afraid of the dead. For example, if you bring a dead corpse into this place, I'm sure people will run away from here. That was, a, that was a particular case. I think in the book of Kings, when um, some people were going to bury a dead man, and they saw a hammy coming, you know what they did? When they saw the hammy coming, they threw the dead body into the, um, the grave of Elisha. And the moment the body touched the bone of Elisha, he revived. When he saw those hammy too, what did he do? He also picked race. But if he was dead, he wouldn't be afraid. Because dead people don't fear. They are dead already. How can you kill a dead man? Huh? Someone is dead already. How can you kill him? He's dead already. How can you scare a dead person? Because he's dead. He's dead. And when you are dead, you will be free from the power of sin over your life. So freedom from sin does not require you to be going through all kinds of counseling there is only one, sol one solution to the freedom, I mean to getting freedom from sin. That is death. Die on the cross. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Crucified with Christ. That is the only solution. Die on the cross. And how do you die? Simply by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe the true gospel. The reason why people are not dying today is because what they hear is not the gospel of Jesus. Something brought them here. If you truly hear the gospel, you will die when you respond to it. So I blame pastors and preachers for the people who are still bound by sin in the assemblies of God. Because if your members are still sinning, your elders are still sinning anyhow, then check what you are preaching to them. If what they hear is the gospel and they respond to it, they will die. They will die. Amen. We've treated four types of the inheritance that we have in Christ. Three. I said four. The first one is what? We have received eternal life from God. The life of God himself, the zoe of God is life has come inside of us. Now, do you know that when that life comes inside of us, you can't die anymore. When the life of God comes into you, you can't die again. You can't experience a second death because his life has entered into you. Those who, have, those who have not received his life will experience the second death. So, before we round up, I'm going to do something here, and which is to call out those, not for you to come out, but for us to pray together. For those who have not received the life of God on the inside of you. Yes, you are a member of a fellowship, but the life of God does not reside on the inside of you. You know that. And we're going to pray together, and that life will come into you. Because if that life doesn't come into you, you're going to experience a second death. And that is very dangerous. Because when you die the second time, you have totally taken away from the presence of God and from the glory of his power. You are going to forever be in a lake of fire, burning with sulfur. And that is not the place you should be. It's not a place you should be. It's a dangerous place to be. The first one we have received from God is what? Eternal life. The second one is kingdom, the kingdom of God. The third one, the Holy Spirit has been given to us as our inheritance. 
the Holy Spirit has been given to us as an inheritance. Galatians, I think, chapter 3 and verse 14. Paul said that we have been redeemed from the cause of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law, being made a cause for us, that we might receive the blessing of Abraham through faith and the Holy Spirit by faith that has been promised unto us. And then the fourth one we have received from God is God's divine nature. Of course, there are so many other ones. I have just picked out these four. In fact, the Bible summed, summed it up this way in the second, um, second Peter 1 verse 4 that God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So study and get more for yourself. Amen. Now let's look at, like, look at the future inheritance that we have in Christ. A future inheritance in Jesus. If you remember the um, scripture we read, Ephesians 1, you will see that the word inheritance was mentioned twice in that scripture. Verse 11 and verse 14. And then it was also mentioned in Colossians 1 verse 12. But the thing is, that inheritance in Colossians 1 12 is not the same as the inheritance in Ephesians 1 verse 14. They are not the same thing. There is one we have received now. But there is one that is kept for us in heaven which we are going to receive later. And we need to look at what that inheritance is. And the truth is, everything we have received now, we are also going to inherit later. For example, Jesus said, if you believe in me, you are going to receive eternal life. Right? Do you know that when we also see Jesus, we are going to inherit eternal life also? We have received the kingdom of God. When we also see Jesus on the last day, we are going to inherit the kingdom again. Let's look at this scripture. Ephesians 1 again, verse 13 and verse 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Ephesians 1. In whom you also trusted after... You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. A woman also, after, be, after having believed, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sorry, go back to that verse 13 again. When were you sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise? When you believe, right? When you have believed in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is a seal. Like we read yesterday, that the Holy Spirit becomes a stamp. On you that you are now God's own, you are God's property, you are God's possession. It's like a, an engagement, I mean, um, what do they call it? engagement ring? That okay, one day I will get married to you. It's given to us after we have believed. Now, verse 14. Who is the guarantee? The Holy Spirit is given to us as a guarantee. Now, this Holy Spirit we have received here is not the same thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's different. This is what you receive when you become born again. There are people who will not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit till they die because they've not been taught about it, but they will still go to heaven and inherit that promise. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has already taken residence in their hearts. They are born again. So when the Holy Spirit comes into you, in is in you, he is a guarantee. Of that inheritance that is kept for us. The inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. And what is that? What is that purchased possession? We'll look at it. We'll find out. Romans chapter 3. Sorry. Romans chapter 8. Verse 23. Romans 8 verse 23. What is that purchased possession? What is that? God? See. This is the way it is. I don't know whether we do it here in Nigeria, but I think it's practice overseas. If you want to buy something, you can um, make a down payment. But if you do that to some people here, your money and your good is all gone. But I think it's, it's being practiced overseas. You want to buy something, you make a down payment. You collect it. Is it do you collect it? Then after you finish payment, the thing is now yours. Now, when God gave us his Holy Spirit, and it takes residence in our hearts. 
God purchased us. Spirit, soul, and body. But that body is not yet going to be redeemed until that day. But he gave it to us as a stamp that I have already purchased this person. It's now mine. One day, I will redeem his body too. And that is why the Bible says, not only that, but we also who have, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. I thought we have been redeemed. You know, when Adam sinned, who first died? The spirit man. What died later? The body. The same thing happens in our salvation experience. When we are saved, who first got saved? The spirit man. What will be saved later? The body. The same way. The same way. That is why salvation is in three phases. That is the first one we have received now when we become born again. You are saved. Your soul is being saved. And that happens by studying the word and obeying the word. You renew your soul. You renew your mind every time by studying the word and obeying it. And then your body will be saved. In fact, the Bible says it this way. The Bible said that it's a salvation that's going to be revealed to us on the last day. And this is going to be the redemption of our body. That is what God has kept for us in heaven. They are going to possess. And do you know when we possess that body, they are going to be like him. The Bible says when we see him, we shall be like him. Truly like him. No more sickness, no more disease, no more curses, no more heartache, nothing. We shall be like him. We are going to have a glorious celestial body. And I'll see Femi the way he is. The true one, the true Femi. With a glorious body. A body without any limitation. Without any boundary. Without any barrier. Do you understand? Do you understand? Let's look at this scripture also. Second Peter 1 verse 4. Or let's start from verse 3. Second Peter 1. Let's start from verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things. Sorry, I beg your pardon. First Peter, first Peter 1. First Peter 1. First Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved where yeah. reserved in heaven second corinthians 5 talks about the building of god which is going to be our new body that is what god has kept for us to be received on that day of christ but there is a danger even though the bible says we are an heir of god's promise remember romans eight seventeen. We are children of God, and if children, then heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. And he has not received what has been given. It's only a, a potential, potential um, successor. Do you understand? And he has not yet received that possession. It's, but it has been marked that this person will eventually receive this possession. But do you know and he can be disqualified from receiving it? Now, to be an heir, well, I think there are only three that I know. Maybe there are other ones. Number one, either by birth or by adoption or by the goodwill of the owner of that possession. The person cannot, can just decide, I want to give my, I want to will all my estate to this person. Like I, like I heard that there was a particular man who died, a rich woman, wealthy woman, who willed her estate to a dog. And then the dog was the one inside the limousine. The driver was driving the dog. What would the dog enjoy? Now, the good, <laughs> the good will of the woman made I will all her estate 
to a dog. So the dog was an apparent, apparent heir of that woman. Eventually became a successor of the woman when she died. But an heir can be disqualified from receiving the possession for so many reasons. We we'll look at the case of Esau, for example. Esau was an apparent heir of Isaac's possession. It was a culture at that time that the firstborn receives a double of what the father has because of his responsibility over the rest of the children. That was why when Esau, Esau and Jacob, they are twins. You know that. Do you know that? Because, but we are painted it to be that Esau and Jacob are like brothers. They are like a senior brother and a younger brother. But that is not true. They are twins. They are twins. But one came out first, and that was Esau. And it was the culture at that time that this man is going to inherit the blessing of the father and his property. And Jacob knew that. And then cunningly, he deceived Esau. And Esau sold his birthright unto that man. By oath. When the time came to receive the blessing, the scripture says he was rejected. Though he was an apparent heir of that possession, but yet he was disqualified from receiving it. So one can be an heir and still be disqualified from receiving what God has promised. It's very possible. By the way, let me even say something about the firstborn. I know there are some services that people run today. They say the firstborn service. There's nothing like that anymore. It's not scriptural. God himself, and I know what they usually quote, is the Old Testament. But right in the Old Testament himself, God said, now the Lord, the firstborn and mine is no longer true. All the Levites are now mine. Not only the firstborn anymore. I, does that mean that the rest of the children are not important to God? And so we do firstborn service. All the firstborn in your family, let them come for a service. All those things are not scriptural anymore. We are all joint heads with Christ. They are no longer scriptural. And I know some people still do it today. Write books on firstborn. Huh? Write books on firstborn. I, so, where do they get all these things from? I don't understand. And I'm sure all in the name of making money. Abby? All in the name of making... I know some of you might be offended. That what, what do you mean? Our pastor does that in our church. Ask your pastor to show you the scripture. Where that is allowed. You know, the New Testament is supposed to interpret the whole. And show me a place in the New Testament where, where that was being practiced. Even in the Old Testament, God himself said, though I said that the firstborn are mine, but now all the Levites are now mine. Not Joseph, not firstborn anymore. God himself said that. God himself said that. But we run firstborn services and do all kinds of things in the church today. Anyway, that is not my, my, my issue. But the thing is, though Jacob, I mean, sorry, Esau was an heir of Isaac's possession, yet he was disqualified. Why? Because he couldn't delay his fleshly desire. And he was disqualified. He was totally disqualified. And he wept to get it. But the Bible says he couldn't get it anymore. Because it was late. He wept to get it. But he couldn't get it. One danger to inheriting the promises of God, the future inheritance he has promised unto us, is sin. When you cannot deny your fleshly desire, you are, you are going to be cut off from inheriting that promises. You will be cut off from inheriting it. Even though you are part of God's kingdom today, but you will not inherit that kingdom when Jesus appears because you are indulging in sin. Sin I refer to as indulging or gratifying your fleshly desire. You want all things by all means. Even though God has said don't do it, you still want to do them. Those things can disqualify you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 first corinthians 6 verse 19 the bible says
First Corinthians chapter 6, sorry, verse 9, I beg your pardon. First Corinthians 6, verse 9. The Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you are a believer and yet you live an unrighteous life, you can't inherit it. Though you might be an heir of that kingdom, you can't inherit. Because the unrighteous cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Be ye not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Who was Paul talking to here? The Corinthian church. nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Verse 10. Nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. If you fall into any of this category, you can't inherit it. So you need to repent. And turn to God. If you indulge in sin, I don't care what sin it is. I don't care what people have preached to you about the grace of God. Grace does not indulge people in sin. God's grace does not indulge sin. It doesn't. Grace teaches us to deny ungodly lust. But all these kind of teachings that people have been preaching today, that when you receive the grace, God cannot destroy you. Don't worry. His grace is abundant. Even when you are sinning, His grace will cover you, cover you up and cover all your sins. That is a lie. Do you know that any time the Bible talks about the doctrine of God, it uses a singular word, doctrine. Jesus said in John chapter 7 verse, I think verse 14 or verse 16, Jesus said, the doctrine that I give to you is not mine but my father's. But any time you hear doctrines, it has to do with the teachings of men and the doctrines of demons. Any year you hear the word doctrines, and there are all kinds of doctrines in the world today. All kinds. Telling you that it doesn't matter, you can sin. God will still cover you. You are still his child. It doesn't matter what, that, what you do. The Bible says thieves. Thieves cannot inherit it. Thieves. And somebody still and they ask him, why did you steal? For the ministry's sake. For the sake of the church. Thieves cannot inherit the kingdom of God. A fornicator. You don't say all these things in the church because you are afraid people will run away. A fornicator cannot inherit the kingdom. It doesn't matter how many tongues you speak. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. A fornicator cannot inherit God's kingdom. A liar. You know that one is very common. Lying is very common. In fact, it's the most commonest. Lying and fornication the most commonest of all. All kinds of lies. Like, like somebody told me yesterday that... Um, um, I won't mention the name. It's young girl, but I know it was a joke anyway. You said, "Ah, no, there are all kinds of there are different kinds of lies, though." And I said, "Okay, mention them." And I heard she said, "Abrahamic lie." <laughs> that is <laughs> now Abrahamic lie is one because Abraham lied. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. Mm -mm. If you're a liar, you can't inherit God's kingdom. Whether it is Abrahamic or Mosaic or all kinds of lies, you ain't going to enter. Lying is God had to straighten Abraham up and said, Walk before me and be perfect. Stop all this nonsense you're doing. Walk before me and be perfect. All kinds of lies put a stop to them. Uh, that that um, uh, is wisdom. I'm just applying wisdom. There's nothing like that. It's a lie. It's a lie. Lie is lie. And do you know one thing about lying? When you tell a lie, you have to borrow another lie to cover up that one. 
take another one and cover it so that that lie will not be exposed. And then you'll be a perpetual liar. Lying is evil. To stop you from inheriting the kingdom of God. All kinds of things the Bible mentioned that time will fail me to go into them. Thieves, effeminate, adulterers, idolaters. You know, idolatry and covetousness are the same. When you are greedy, greedy for money, you want money by all means. Can't inherit it. Let me begin to round up. Another danger that can stop us from inheriting God's kingdom is unbelief. Unbelief. Hebrews 3 verse 12. Hebrews 3 verse 12. Unbelief. Hebrews 3 and verse 12. Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Unbelief is evil. The Bible calls it an evil heart of unbelief. And that has the capacity to cause you to depart from God. It can cut you off from God. It can take you away from God. Unbelief. Unbelief can do that. And when, when you are cut off from God, you can't inherit his kingdom. You can't. And the one last thing that I would like to talk about here is disobedience. Disobedience. You might find this, you might find this very, um, is it challenging? Or it might disturb you a little. But I will, I will um, tell what Jesus, what Jesus um, said in this parable. Uh, maybe you now fault, um, fault the words of Jesus or not. Jesus said, a man had three servants and he gave to one five talents. Gave to one two. Gave to one one. And then the one that was given five went to trade with it. I mean with them, made five more. The one that was given to went to trade with the two talents, made extra two. The one that was given one, what did he do with it? Buried it inside the ground. What did the master tell him? Collect that talent from him. Give it to someone that is profitable. And the Bible says, and cast this unprofitable servant into where? Outer darkness. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you live in disobedience to God, you can't inherit his kingdom. If you live in disobedience, unfortunately, that is one of the major sins of the body of Christ. Live in disobedience. Go and talk to that man about Jesus. Ah, no, I can't do it. Go and do this. No, I can't do it. Go and do that. No, I can't. If you continually live in disobedience, you can't inherit his kingdom. You can't. Because you are not profitable to God. You are not profitable to him. Disobedience is deadly. It's very deadly. Let me give you... There are so many examples I can give. Concern, even concerning my own life and concerning things that I've heard about people. Let, but let me give you one or two. That was a particular man of God. And the Lord, the Lord spoke to someone that I respect so much in the, in the ministry. I call him a father. He's going to be with the Lord now. And he told these two men of God and said, you, the Lord said, you should go to Lagos. That is where he's going to work with you to do the work of the Lord. And you go to, I think, Kano. And then, after giving the word of the Lord to them, he turned back and he was about to leave. And God told him and said, the, the, the two of them are scorning what you just said. But don't worry. And he just left. Few months later, about six months after, they brought in a sick man to these two men to pray because they, all toge they are together. I mean, they were together for, for them to pray for him. Eventually, the man died in their hands. And they couldn't explain what happened. So they were both thrown into the prison. But somehow, they came out. And they now remembered the word of the Lord that that man gave to them. That if you don't obey, disaster will come upon you. And that happened after two years. 
do you know when this man, one of them that was supposed to come to Lagos, eventually arrived in Lagos and said, God, I have come. God said, I've been waiting for two years. You didn't show up. I've left. Huh? Been waiting for two years. You didn't show up. So don't worry. The man struggled in ministry till he died. He was struggling because he didn't obey God. See, God is gracious. I'm not taking that away. But God is also very, 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 I don't want to use the word dangerous, but it's someone to, to hold in a great awe and respect. Don't, don't trivialize his instructions. Don't, don't mess up with what he's doing. Yes, he's very gracious. He's very merciful. He is. He is. No doubt about that. But you can't continually abide, abide, I mean, uh, abide in sin and expect grace to continue. It's not possible. You can't continually indulge in disobedience in sin and expect God to still be showing you love and mercy and kindness and all kinds of things. It's not. God can be hungry. Like Pastor Femi shared yesterday, God was angry with the people of Israel for 40 years. For 40 years. He was angry with them, yet he was giving them the things that they needed. Giving them water, giving them food. For 40 years. And then wasted all of them in the wilderness. All of them. Not one inherited the promise. Not one. Except Joshua and Caleb who believed what God has said. Only those two. So I want to encourage you please. Walk in total obedience. Everybody say total obedience. Say total obedience. Walk in total obedience. I think I'm done. Let's rise on our feet. We're going to pray. Let's rise on our feet. We're going to pray. There are two things we're going to do here. For those, we are going to close our eyes. For those who have not received the life of God inside of you, you're going to pray. You will lift your hands wherever you are. Then we're going to pray together. We're going to lead you to the presence of God today. If you have not received the life of God, with all our eyes closed, let's close our eyes. If you know the life of God is not yet inside of you, you don't have his life on the inside. Can you lift your hand wherever you are? And let's pray together. Lift it high so that we can pray together. I'd like you to pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. And you rose again from the dead. From today, I am yours. Come into my heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer, I want to congratulate you. Because now, the life of God has entered into you. You are not, no longer the same. You are no longer the same. The very life of God is now inside of you. Amen? I'd like you to wait briefly after um, we're done with this so that Pastor Femi can talk to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? For those who have lifted their hands, just wait. Which side should they go to? That you can talk to them. Okay, to this side, please, so that we can talk to you and pray more with you. Amen? Let's still close our eyes. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. I'd like you to Ponder down what you have had today. If you are still indulging in sin or in disobedience, I'd like you to talk to God that God should have mercy upon you today. That those sins will not debar you from inheriting his kingdom. That God show me mercy today. Have mercy upon me. Mention those things to God. That God have mercy upon me. And from today, I won't go back to these things anymore. In the name of Jesus. Lord, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Help me, O oh God, to obey you. To obey you totally. To obey you with the whole of my heart. Help me, O oh God, to live holy and righteously before you. All the days of my life. In the precious name of Jesus. Spirit of 
the living God fall afresh on me spirit of the living God fall afresh on me let's say it again spirit of We want it to come upon us again. Mold me, break me, feel me. Use me, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. Lift your hands and ask Him to come upon you afresh again. The Lord, I come to you today. I've repented of all my sins. Now you have washed me in your precious blood. Come afresh upon me to obey you, to do your will, to do your will in the name of Jesus. To do your will, to do what is right in your sight, to walk perfectly before you, to walk holy, to walk in a righteous way, to walk in love, to do what you want me to do all the days of my life. Come upon me, Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the Living God, fall. God just personally talk to God I'm not leaving any, leaving any prayer just we have had the word 